Hi, I'm Tony Northup, and for chapter six of my book, Stunning Digital Photography, I'd like to talk about shooting group portraits, especially family portraits. The first thing that people will ask you is what sort of clothes should they wear? And the answer is about the same for individual portraits, and that is muted colors, solid colors, no stripes, no logos or big brands. Uh, you need to tell them, especially with the kids, they don't get to pick their own clothing today. Otherwise, they're gonna pick like a bright orange shirt with a huge transformer on it. And for the next 20 years, you're gonna be looking at this awful dated logo. Just get as plain clothes as you can. That works well if you're shooting like two or three people in a group. If you get into bigger groups, four, five, six, you need to start coordinating clothes a little bit. Uh, my formula is always button down white shirt and blue jeans. It doesn't look too matchy matchy. It doesn't look too silly to have everybody in the same thing. Uh, it looks fairly natural and most people have a white shirt and if they don't, they can get one pretty inexpensively. You don't wanna to try to match other colors. You don't wanna have everybody show up in like a light blue shirt because you'll get some people who are in like turquoise and some are like darker shades of blue and it just ends up looking not that great. Next, I'll talk about choosing a background for a group photo. Now, I assume that you don't have a studio like this. In this case, you might be choosing a background inside a house or outdoors. And it's much harder to pick a background for a group photo than it is for an individual photo because if you're taking a picture of a person, you can just zoom in and do a headshot and blur the background and it doesn't matter that much. But with a group shot, you're gonna have to step back you also can't use a really shallow depth of field, so you'll never get a great background blur. That means the background's gonna be more prominent. So look for really clean lines, like a nice hillside or just a line of a beach. The ocean is a great place for that. And if there is going to be something behind them, like if it's the family house or a fence or something else, put as much distance between the background and your subjects as possible. That will allow it to blur at least a little bit. I like to have 20 or 30 feet. In other words, you don't want somebody standing right next to a brick wall. Have them step as far away from it as you can. Uh, but managing that background is gonna to be tough because the background is going to be huge the farther back you get. That's why it's important to do some location scouting ahead of time. If you do wanna set up your own backdrop support system like I have behind me, it doesn't cost that much. A uh, decent white backdrop and a support system, it costs you about 50 bucks. Look into Cowboy Studios, it's inexpensive but flexible. The problem is a system like this isn't really great for more than about six or seven people. Uh, you'll have to cram the people in as tight as you can even for that. Uh, the reason is that you just need a lot of space and these things are usually eight or nine feet across. So you'll need a big room, you'll need high ceilings and really crank it up there. Uh, most of the time for most people who don't have a big studio, you're better off doing it outdoors. I actually find it easier to light groups of people than I do individuals. When you shoot an individual, you usually try to get the shadows on the face just perfect and make sure everything is like nice and soft and glamorous. But when you shoot a group, well, the faces are smaller in the frame, so they're not as much of a focal point. And frankly, there's no way to light individuals in a group so perfectly. So I just end up making the light as soft as possible. This can be as easy as just using a bounce flash and pointing it towards the ceiling. If you happen to have a studio, you can grab soft boxes and just put them on either side of your subjects. It doesn't hurt to have a hard light behind them acting as a kicker light or a hair light. So if you happen to have an extra flash or a strobe, just set it bare and behind them and it'll just give a little rim light. Otherwise, just get as soft as you can. If you're shooting outdoors, put everyone in the shade or at least put the sun to the back, but don't have the sun in front of them, otherwise everybody will be squinting into it. And if you're in the shade or it's an overcast day, use a little fill flash, just use your on-camera flash and add a tiny bit of fill to add a catch light to the eyes and fill in any shadows. Composition is the art of framing your picture, and I see people do it wrong with group shots all the time. Now, my first rule of thumb with group shots is you don't need to see anybody below the waist. You wanna see mostly faces and some chests, but I see people just stand back and try to take a picture of the whole person and there's no need for that. We don't need to see people's shoes. What you want to see are the faces because that's what we care about. And you're gonna to try to fill up the frame with faces as much as possible. So you're going to arrange people so that their faces fill almost the entire frame. That means getting people really, really close together, even turning them sideways and having their chest to their back. 
or having people, if, if you arrange people in multiple rows, you're gonna have people with their backs against the fronts of the next person behind them. This allows you to cram people as close together, fit as many phrases, faces in the frame as possible, and get as tight as you can. Now, word of warning about composition, a lot of people wanna make eight by 10 prints of their family photos. And that shape is not as wide as your camera is. Your camera shoots about this wide, and an eight by 10 is about like this. With an eight by 10, you have to cut one inch off of each side. So keep that in mind as you're composing the picture. If you're just gonna stick it on Facebook, doesn't matter, fill up the whole frame. If you plan to make a print, leave some room on the left and right for framing. So let's talk about doing family portraits with children. Children pose a particular challenge because they're shorter than everybody else, they're kids. So if you have a little baby, you can just have the person stand and hold it in their arms. That brings the face close enough that you should still be able to crop nice and tight. What I do if families have toddlers, I'll just have the family get on the floor. Everybody can just sit down and do a seated pose. Seating is a really easy way to level out everybody's height. As you build larger groups and you have to have multiple rows, you'll have to have the heads at different heights so that you can stack them together. And there are a few ways to do this. You usually don't want people mixed seating and standing, though that's okay to do. Um, what I usually do is I will have what's called apple boxes, which are just wooden boxes that people can stand on. And you can bring those out to raise people up to different heights. If you don't have that, you can just pull out some big paperback or hardback books and have them stand on that. Uh, for taller people, you can have them take their shoes off and you know take off maybe an inch of height. I warn you against having people kind of crouch or stand on their tiptoes. That's a lot of people's instinct. But what happens then is people are thinking about their tiptoes and usually they have a silly like tiptoe face. Camera settings are actually really challenging when you're shooting a group shot. The easiest part is gonna be the shutter speed. You need a shutter speed of about 1 60th or 1 1 25th to freeze the action. If you have any sort of movement going on, especially little kids, you better err on the side of faster and go for 1 1 25th. So now that we know the shutter speed, we have to adjust the ISO and the aperture. Most of the time with portraits, I recommend people use the lowest f-stop number they can, but that's when you're shooting a single person you wouldn't wanna shoot a group at f2.8 because what you'd find is one person would be in focus and nobody else would be in focus. The depth of field with a typical portrait lens is really, really shallow. So shallow that you can get the person's eye in focus and their nose and hair will be completely out of focus. So you can imagine if you have a couple rows of people or even two people who seem to be side by side, one of them will be completely blurry. That's no good. So you end up using a higher f-stop number. If I'm shooting two people standing side by side, I usually try to get to about F8. If I'm shooting more than that, or shooting multiple rows, I need to go way up there. I need to be like F16 if I wanna be sure that everybody's sharp. It also means that I usually end up using a wider angle lens. So while I shoot a headshot of a single person at 200 millimeters in F28, for a group shot of three or four people, I'll usually be at 100 millimeters and say F11. If it's a larger group, I might go all the way down to 50 millimeters and then say F16 or even higher. To test your camera settings, you're gonna take a picture and then you're going to zoom in and make sure that everybody's face is in focus. If it's not in focus, you can try to adjust your focus a little bit or you need to increase that f-stop even more. Now, having that really high f-stop and being stuck with your shutter speed means that your ISO is going to have to go up. Um, so it's nice to have a lot of light. If you don't happen to have a lot of light, you're just gonna have to use a higher ISO because something has to give. Now, the way depth of field works when you focus is about a third of the depth of field is close to, closer to you than your focusing point. But most of the sharpness, about two thirds of it is going to be after the point you focused on. So if you have multiple rows of people, I suggest you focus on the front of the middle row if you have just two rows of people, I would go ahead and focus on the front row. That's going to be your best bet and the best way to get as many people in focus as possible. As you're taking pictures, I find that the one, two, three cheese thing still works better than just about anything else. Uh, with an individual's portrait, especially with kids, it's fun to get kind of silly sometimes, but I find that with groups of kids, 
if there's more than one kid in the family, they tend to lose control and pretty soon they're making like wacky faces. If that does happen, what I like to do is I like to say, okay, now we're gonna take a silly shot. So everybody make your silliest face. And then after that, we're gonna take a couple of serious shots. With a group shot, you're gonna end up taking a lot of pictures. And the more people in the group, the more pictures you're going to take. Think of it this way. If you're taking a picture of an individual person, you probably need four or five frames just to get one where the person has a good expression and they're not blinking or making like a derp face. Um, so if you have two people, mathematically that would mean you'd need 16 shots to get one picture where both people had a good face. And it's a permutation. You add another person out there and suddenly you're up to needing 48 pictures and so on. So when you get into big groups of eight or 10 people, you're just gonna have to take as many shots as you can before people lose their patience. It's not unusual for me to be there for, you're lucky to get 10 or 15 minutes out of a group, but just keep clicking, try to keep people smiling. That means you need to keep smiling, you need to keep talking, and just keep taking shots. Now, you're still gonna to have to go back and do some post-processing, and you know what? It, with a group of eight or 10 people, I never find a shot where everybody's face is great. So it's not uncommon for me to erase people's heads and from take it from one frame and put it into another. So I kind of mix and match. I take everybody's best head and stick it in there. It's a lot easier if you have a nice clean background like the sky or a white backdrop. Um, it's pretty hard if you have a complex backdrop like a brick wall or something. It's just harder to do the cloning. So in summary, I actually think group shots are a little bit easier than individual portraits, mostly because they're typically so standard. Everybody kind of stands there and smiles and you don't have to worry about fancy posing or anything. Uh, make everybody comfortable, stay really smiley, uh, nice soft light. You can just bounce a flash off the ceiling and you're probably good. Uh, it helps to have another person there so that they can check everybody's ties and make sure that nobody's hair is blocking anybody else. If you like this video, please click subscribe up above to see more new videos when I release them and click like down below just to show me your support. And please check out my book, Stunning Digital Photography, which has more than three hours of video like this. Of course, it's a full and really long book so you can read it, but I help break it up with lots of videos that support the book. And this sort of video training would otherwise be really expensive. So check the links in the description below and please check me out on Facebook, the Northrop Photography page. If you have any questions, you can ask me there or send me an email at tony at northrop.org. Thanks so much.